Michael Carr, we talked to you quite a bit and learned that you are a, a student of, of history uh, and certainly know a, a lot about the history of Boston. 1982 was the last time the NAACP convention uh, was here. And as Jim just said, and as everybody has said, it was a different time in Boston then. Yeah, yeah so a uh, different time. Um, issues are very similar, right? If we got together in 1982 and you were talking about mass incarceration or criminal justice issues, or housing, or education equity, or affirmative action, uh, or uh, you know, uh, opportunity gaps. Um, that was true in the, then, and it's true now. Um, the gaps are still the same. Women, uh, black women, still die at higher rates in, in giving birth uh, then and now. Uh, so I, while I think the city's different, right? We've progressed uh, from that time period. The data speaks for itself. We still have a lot of the same challenges. And I always tell people, we, we tend to be the best of the worst in Massachusetts. Um, we suck, but there are a whole bunch of places that suck more. Um, Beautifully put, Michael. But we shouldn't celebrate that because that's, that's about life and death. That's about uh, uh, lack of wealth. That's about lack of opportunity. So, uh, yeah, we celebrate that we're better than we were in 1982, but we're not where we need to be. Well, you know, you grew up in Boston, and I was reading in preparation for coming here today some of the where we were in 1982, and I remembered um, I was a young reporter at the Herald uh, when William Atkinson was a young black Tom, man, 30-year-old black man, chased down the Savin Hill oh, William, yep. tracks by a group of white kids and yep. basically beaten to death. And I remember going to his home and talking to his mother, and it was almost beyond wow. belief and that kind of thing was not that unusual in Boston yeah. then yeah and there's many stories right I you know I used to look at this history around police use of force and there are these stories uh, in history 70s 80s where officers would say that because they didn't feel like chasing you they'd shoot you uh, but you can only do that in Roxbury <laughs> you couldn't do that in West Roxbury and you couldn't do that in Newton but in, in Roxbury, because there wasn't a respect for black lives in most of this country's history, and I would argue uh, today, um, you could have law enforcement say, hey, you know, I, I, I shot him because I didn't think he would stop. Um, and that's history. That's documented history. Yep. Boston Globe yep. article from, um, I think, the 1970s. Um, and then there's Levi Hart, uh, Joe Feaster, Attorney Feaster uh, was around, and I think president during that time, that Levi Hart case. So there's a lot of stories in history. We like to, we like to be uh, forgetful in, in Boston. We don't like to think about the past because it makes us not feel good. But the, the problem with that is if you don't understand the past and you have no understanding of where we are and why we're where we are. We're talking to Michael Curry on the national board of the NAACP, and I think he's too modest to say we're not for, I guess, a text between him and a guest we're going to have in about 30 minutes, uh, former Mayor Walsh. This convention would not be in Boston. He's smiling, so I think it's true. You know, you've made clear to us on our show, uh, Michael, in the last few months, while this is a gathering of thousands of local and national advocates who care about uh, racial justice, civil rights, that sort of thing, it's also a business meeting, yeah. and you're sort of in charge of the business of the meeting as head of the policy committee. What kinds of decisions is this convention going to make in the next few days? I don't know what kinds of issues. Well, one is uh, we are constitutionally mandated. So it's Article 9, I believe, that requires us to meet annually and to take up policy issues at this annual convention. So receptions, the gatherings, the parties are great. Um, but the main purpose is, is for us to elect delegates on a local level, cities and towns, 22 units across this country, college chapters, uh, youth units, to elect voting delegates, have them come to one major city uh, each year, and they come and they present resolutions throughout the year. They're vetted by one of the committees that I serve on resolutions, or they come to my committee, which I chair advocacy and policy. If, uh, if they pass the test, meaning that they are constitutionally uh, appropriate, then they're uh, debated, discussed, and presented at this meeting. So it's affirmative action, it's health care, it's housing, it's education, it's criminal justice issues. So a wide range of issues that we'll take up. And you'll see folks as you witness this process, uh, they'll put the amendment up on the screen. Folks will uh, debate it like you would in a legislative body, and they'll put their cards up if they want to vote for it. It's a beautiful process to watch. It's a democratic process to watch. And it is moms and pops and young people from across the country um, advancing that policy. It's one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen in all my years doing this. 
Now, uh, this convention, if it's successful, will not only change the city in some ways, but change perception of Boston by your colleagues from across the country. We've discussed with you uh, so many times the poll from 2017 that was in the Globe among African Americans across the country. How welcoming are these eight major American cities, the people of color? Unfortunately, number one least welcoming by a long shot was the city we're sitting in, yeah. in Boston. What do you hope that your colleagues from the across the country will be exposed to in the next week that will cause them to go home and hopefully say, the Boston of today is not the Boston of 1982 and thereabouts. So, so I'm going to be a little pr provocative when I say this, but it's true. Right? Boston is a racist city. <laughs> so like New York, like Chicago, like Miami, like L.A., it's a racist city. The racism here looks different. It feels different. But I tell people all the time, you have to, if you want to see racism and you know what it looks like, you'll see it everywhere. You'll see it in the gaps, the disparities, the inequities, the treatment. It's the restaurant when you walk in, you're an African-American patron, and that person doesn't come to greet you, or they think you're the wait staff at the hotel, right? It still happens to this day, and I'm a black Bostonian, born and raised, um, and I can tell you it happens to me to this day in this city. So one is we gotta get dispel this notion that we're so much better that we're not that city anymore. Um, so that's one. Two, but we're not what we were. So I, I talked to an African-American gentleman last night. He spoke at the, uh, well, I introduced him, uh, Jim, so you remember. He's one of the, the hotel managers uh, in great. Boston. I think he may be the first black hotel manager, mm -hmm. at least he thinks he might be, at the Hyatt Regency. And he said, Michael, I came here a few years ago and I had a lower level position and somebody called me a racist term in the hotel lobby. It was uh, a, a, a person staying at the hotel. He said, I left here and I promised I would never come back. He said, and then I got recruited to come back uh, to run this hotel. And he said, I'm pleasantly surprised it's not the same place. That that kind of overt racism I haven't experienced since I came back and that's why I'm staying here. So I say that to say, um, he had a great story to tell, but racism still lives, it breathes. Uh, walk around our neighborhoods, walk at the disparities with Roxbury, walk in Newton, I mean, uh, Cleveland Circle, Copley Square, and see why there's so many black folks who do not come out of Roxbury, Dorchester, Matt Mattapan, into our uh, downtown areas. There's a reason for that, is that we don't feel welcomed, uh, we don't feel respected, and we gotta find a way. So that our, we hope, I hope, Jim, to get to your question, I hope that when they walk into a restaurant here in the seaport or anywhere around town, they're greeted with a smile. And I hope someone says, hey, I'm glad you're here. Um, and I'm nervous about that because it takes one, uh, what is it, one time to make a bad impression. Right? And I'm hoping that the city's ready to receive us that way. When you say you're nervous about that, you're nervous about that in terms of this convention happening this weekend? Or are you nervous about that in general going forward or both? I mean, one is just the weekend because I feel like, you know, it's my house, you know, so I yeah. feel like I invited people over my house. I want to make sure the bathroom's clean. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure that, you know, they're greeted well. Um, but I also want to make sure that the, the house look good, feels good after they leave as well. But right now I'm worried about making sure that people are receiving uh, folks that are coming to the city. And, you know, I feel good. I feel like the city's aware. Thanks to Michelle Wu, Mayor Wu, phenomenal job. Meet Boston, the Mass Convention Center uh, Authority have done a phenomenal job of getting the city ready for us. So I feel good about that. You, you talked a lot about, uh, to us and to other people as well, about wanting everybody to come here, not just think this is not just about black Boston, uh, national black uh, groups, the NAACP all around the country. Why does that matter? Well, one is, uh, and I get to talk about the end, history of the NAACP all the time. Folks don't realize that this was a multiracial effort that started the NAACP. So, uh, and I'll say this really quickly, Niagara Movement, Black men organized, William Monroe Trotter, Bostonian, W.B. Du Bois were organizing in 1905, started the Niagara Movement. Black women were eventually allowed here in Boston, third meeting to let black women participate. Uh, you had a, a, a Springfield race riot in 1908, two black men, the history of this country, black men being accused of attacks on white women, false attacks, two black men in, in Springfield, Illinois. When the town found out that those two black men had been jailed for the accused uh, attacks on white women, thousands of citizens marched on that jail to, to lynch those two black men. Lynching was a culture of this country for most of this country's history. So lynching on 1908, and the white sheriff and a white businessman and others moved those two men out of town. And when the town found out that they'd been moved, 
They started killing, lynching uh, other black citizens. So I say that to say white people across this country joined with black leaders, Mary White Ovington, William English Walling, wrote an article uh, in 1908, Race War in the North. And folks started to come together and start what is now the NAACP. We got to tell those stories because where are our allies at in this moment we're talking about maternal health? Where are our allies at when a little kid gets shot uh, on a street corner? And we got to understand that we have this work to do together and that this is a product of systemic racism in this country. How can we do the work together like Mary White Ovington and William English Walling uh, and Kivy Kaplan, a uh, prominent Jewish citizen who served on the national board before me. How do we come together like that again? Michael Curry, congratulations on bringing the convention here. Wish you a lot of luck in the next week. And thank, thank you. you for getting us here, I should say. No. Yeah. Yeah. Boston Public Radio and GBH would not be in this building were not for your advocacy. We really appreciate it.